All right, welcome folks. I'm Dan Zaster, I'm general manager and programmer for the Smith Rafael Film Center and Rafael at Home. I wanna welcome you to our post-film chat of our latest Rafael at Home offering, Other Music. And I'm really pleased to be joined uh, in this live stream conversation by two gentlemen who, though not directly connected with this film, uh, they're certainly a part of what I call the music store priesthood and uh, have had somewhat similar experiences to what we saw in this documentary. So uh, I'm looking forward to digging into this film with them, uh, then the specifics of uh, music stores, where they are today, where they may be going in the future. And I'm also hoping that uh, we can unpack a little bit more of what's in this film, the intersection of art and commerce, community, technology, human interaction, the need for people to gather. I think we can get to all this in 30 minutes. Uh, before I introduce our guests, uh, I want to thank Oscilloscope Pictures for making this film available to us for our uh, streaming. Uh, I also want to remind you all that you can participate as well. Uh, you can type your questions in the Q&A tab below. Uh, and also, we're going to have a poll uh, that uh, would like you to uh, participate in. We're going to bring that up right now. Uh, the question is, uh, let me go ahead and move this over. On what medium was your first music purchase? Vinyl, cassette tape? CD, MP3, or other? Maybe wax cylinder, eight track tape, we don't know. And uh, this may well be a, uh, an age test more than anything else, but uh, go ahead and fill it out. All right, so uh, all right, let me get into it. Let me welcome our guests. Uh, we have uh, Barry Lazarus. He's the owner operator of Red Devil Records. Uh, his shop first opened in 1998 in Petaluma, and then in 2004, he came to 4th Street in San Rafael. In fact, uh, looking out of the windows here at our California Film Institute offices, his shop is right across the street from us. Uh, so uh, Barry has won many uh, Bay Area publications, best record store polls, and he's considered one of the premier locations to get hard to find vinyls. We also have John Goddard, owner operator in, of the legendary Village Music, uh, it had a storefront in Mill Valley Film, uh, at the Mill, in Mill Valley for many years uh, until closing in 2007. In 2012, the Mill Valley Film Festival premiered his documentary, Village Music, Last of the Great Record Stores. Uh, it was you know, similar to the documentary you've just seen, chronicling the final days of John's store. Uh, John has also been a part, uh, annually a part of our Mill Valley Film Festival, presenting his very popular Heidi Ho Show, uh, rare and vintage music clips. So welcome, John. Welcome, Barry. Thank you for uh, participating. Thank you. Guys. Yeah. Thank you. So um, here's, here's a, a quick question before we dive into this. I'm curious in this time of, uh, of uh, you know, sheltering in place, what music are you listening to? Or maybe more specifically, what was the last album you listened to before this call? John, go ahead. Uh, the last album I listened to before this call was a Little Richard collection. <laughs> well, in, in my here. car on the way here. <laughs> in the car. Same here. That's what I listened to also. Oh, a collection wow. of his original specialty records. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, that's very cool. I will say I've had the same CD in my car for three weeks now, so it's okay. not just because of yesterday. Wow. But, so is that, has that been your go-to music during, during this time? Um, he's on and off, always my go-to music. I, first rock and roll show I ever went to was Little Richard. Yeah. Wow, wow. you saw him live. Well, I was 13 years old, Mission High School in San Francisco. And oh my. he's oh the my. one that got me started on this whole thing. <laughs> wow, yeah. Barry, what about what's been, uh, other than this, the, the, the Richard, what other music have you been listening to over the last? Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Modern Lovers, um, mm -hmm. Jonathan Richmond's first band, they were kind of, kind of a pre-punk type thing. Um, and that, that was the last thing I listened to before Little Richard. Yeah, that's great. Mine was uh, Willie DeVille. Oh, wow. Oh, very cool. Um, I'm curious, had any, either one of you known of the other music, maybe had even visited there at any time during his existence before seeing this film? I'd never been there. I'd heard the name. That's about oh, it. Really? Okay. And Barry, had you heard of the, these folks beforehand? I haven't been to New York in a very long time. So no, I, I, I was not familiar with it. Yeah. Oh. So well, yeah, go ahead. Well, Academy music I've heard a lot about, but no, I have not heard of, of this tour. Yeah. So Barry, let me ask you, how long have you been in the business? I know you started uh, your shop in Petaluma in 98, but how long had you been 
uh, working in the, in the record store business? Um, I, I worked at one other store before then for a couple of years. Yeah. And so um, I, I would say in the record store business before Red Devil, not that, not that long, really, just a couple of years. What got I you mean, into it? Hmm? What got you into it? Oh, um, I, I wanted to, I've always liked working with my hobbies. I mean, I opened one of the first brew pubs in California before, I think we were the third brew pub in California I opened and um, cause I was brewing beer and I, I, I had a stressful job in San Francisco and I, I tried to think of the polar opposite of having a stressful job in San Francisco. So I thought opening a record store in Petaluma was the opposite of that. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and to be honest, I, I, I figured it was a total crapshoot. I had no idea if it really, if I would succeed, but I, I, I just wanted to gamble on it and the gamble paid off. You should open up a, a little tap room in the back of the record store. That's, That's your... a great idea, actually. <laughs> I don't know if the expansion is, uh, first I want to get my doors open again and then we'll think right. about expansion, but, but I like it. Yeah, yeah, we should get into that a little bit later, kind of what, what this new world looks like just with the, with the new protocols for opening up any retail shop. Um, I'm, I'm curious, though, watching the, this film, uh, how close to the mark was it for you watching this and the interaction with the customers and the staff and just the, the feel of, of what that environment of the record store was? Is, is that something you connected with or did, it, did, it, what, did you feel at home watching it, I guess? John? No, go ahead, Barry. Um, I'll go to John. Well, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go okay. ahead John. Yeah, I was asking you, Barry, real quick. I'm going to go to John. Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely uh, rang a bell and, and felt familiar. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, my store is smaller. You know, it's, I mean, I, I gen other than record store day, I worked there by myself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but yes, it, it definitely did. Right. Well, I know for you, John, I just watching it, uh, this film, I thought of you right away, which is why. You know, we're having this conversation. I thought of both of you guys for this Q and A, but certainly you, John, because there's so many parallels uh, with other music and 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 the lifespan of, of village music, uh, especially the in-store concerts, which uh, are pretty amazing that you had back in the day. Yeah, there were a lot of similarities. Um, there were some differences too. I, I just I had a different kind of store in that I wasn't really. A specialty shop like other music was. They, they they thrived on various kinds of new music and didn't seem to go much past that. And I I was a little broader in in that I tried to cover all kinds of music, all periods of music. I mean, to me, Perry Como was as valid as Charlie Parker, who was as valid as David Bowie. I mean, it just all I tried to cover it all which to some level I succeeded, to some level I didn't, but I, I, I didn't really want to be a niche store and just focus on one different thing. Well, I wonder how different doing that kind of a store in you know, Northern California is compared to New York anyways. Are the sensibilities different? You have a, maybe a, a larger pool to pull from, from those aficionados, okay. right? I think it's a space thing. The space. Okay. You can't. You can't do the kind of store I had in a thousand square foot store. Yeah. You just. You can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as, as it was, um, I never. I never had enough room. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, the the thing is, I'm I'm watching this film. Uh, what comes to my mind is, right away, kind of the connection between the record store, the cinema, the bookstore. These are um, uh, the, the interesting connection between these organizations or these types of businesses that uh, were somewhat born out of new technology and then had been threatened by the advance of technology, right? Uh, especially within uh, you know, record stores and the cinema as things are changing. But the thing that rang true to me as I was watching other music, and I know that is true within specialty cinema, is that trusted curator. So, um, John, do you want to speak to that a, a little bit? The, well, they the were when people uh, come in; they're just not consuming; they're not just buying. They're having a conversation about their no, life and this life. Social gatherings, you know. Yeah. Quite often, I felt like a bartender, except we weren't <laughs> drinking. Good, usually. good analogy. Yeah, yeah I, it was, um, and that to me, that's the similarity 
similarity between a good record store and a good bookstore and a good video store when they had them. To be able to be able to discuss what you're interested in and what you're not interested in with somebody that that to some extent knew what you were talking about. And that was that was the fun of it. I mean, the best part of having a record store was turning people on to stuff that they had no idea they cared about. I agree. And that 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 was that was the good part. And in watching what especially for me being in business for 40 years, watching kids listening to Def Leppard and Rush and moving on to, you know, Miles Davis and Charlie Parker or moving on to George Jones and Hank Williams or, you know, moving on to just new and different things as, as they grew up right. was, was a lot of fun. Yeah, and that and that's so cool. that can only happen in that environment. I mean, I know Barry, you I've had the experience in your both your shops and you too, Barry, walking in and, and having a vague idea what I'm looking for. And you both you guys, you know, direct me right to some new discovery. Um, like John said, it's it, it is my favorite part also, yeah. Yeah. You, you can only do you you can only do that with a certain type of clientele though. I mean, you can't do it with everybody. I mean, it, at least for me it was hard to recommend something new and good to somebody that was listening to James Taylor and not much else, you know, but if they come in and say they're, they're listening to Thelonious Monk, can you recommend something? I can do that. Or they're listening to Johnny Cash and want to recommend something else. I could, I could do that. But with a lot of the, especially in the eighties and nineties with a lot of the mainstream stuff, a lot of the clientele that were buying that kind of thing, they didn't want to learn, you know, they just wanted, they wanted what was being played that week. Yeah. And that, that w was one of the reasons I got out of the business. It just wasn't, that part of it wasn't fun anymore because people weren't interested in, in exploring routes and expanding horizons. They just wanted what's popular right now. Yeah. And that gets boring. And then that's the difference between exploring and consuming, I guess, right? Yes, uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it's again. I, I always love to make the analogy between bookstores and, and specialty cinemas. This is the same thing. Are you here to explore and expand, yeah. and learn something? You, and being entertained too. It's important to be entertained. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, both of you guys, this is something that is so fascinating to me. Again, watching this film and knowing my own experiences and knowing how how we again consume music today people will right away point to these algorithms like on Spotify or Pandora. But what they do is reinforce what you're already listening to, don't they? They, they don't break yes. you out of a box. No. And that's what the neighborhood record store would do. Even from something as simply walking in the front door and what are they playing over their, their, their system right now as you're walking in the door, mm -hmm. you know? It's, yeah, that, and that's, yeah. It's not really a question, it's just an observation, but I do have a question on that. So again, my mix between cinema and and um, and records. So I couldn't not mention High Fidelity. Quick question, to both of you guys. What did what do you both think of the film High Fidelity? That uh, John Cusack film. Story of my life. Yes, exactly. Every employee I've ever had was either part and parcel of one of the employees in that store. Yeah. You know, it was like it was like watching my own biography. Although I enjoyed the book more than the more than the movie. So did I. The, they were the a book, lot different from each other. The book other. took place in England, and the guy's lists were so wonderfully esoteric. It just yeah. it was it worked more in the book than it did the the movie. But I loved them. I loved them both. Right. right. I, mean, I knew the. I knew those people. For you as, as well, Barry. Yeah, I loved them both, and I agree. Um, I liked the book a little more. I mean, uh, to me, they were different. The book felt very British, and it was darker. It almost had like a gray atmosphere, like the weather there. And, um, and the book was a little more, it's kind of funny to say visual to me, although um, it was just a book, but yeah. I, I liked them both a lot. They were, I thought they were a lot different from each other, actually. How can you not love somebody that files his record collection by favorite B-sides? That's right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that, how, can not, how can you not relate to that? That makes you want to jump. I'm going to get back to a couple of references to High Fidelity, but you 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 mentioned something that I just loved in the in this film, uh, other music, is how they were uh, filing their records, and they would have sections. You know, they trying to break out. I, I appreciate trying to break out of the general 
generic genres of country or pop or rock, and they had out, they had then, they had decadence. Of course, that's assuming your customers are willing to work a little bit at figuring out what they want and where it is. But what, what kind of creative uh, uh, cataloging had you guys done, or are you currently doing, Barry, in your shop? Uh, I have store fave sections for a lot of genres of music. So um, my uh, rock is too big of a genre to do that, but I have a jazz store favorite, a blues, a punk, and a reggae. And those, so uh, those are the, those are a few, those are the ones that come to mind. And then I have, I have a t kind of a, a table that is, that is rare, rare and collectible on the table. And, um, and although it's not creative, the Beatles have their own s section. They're not even in rock. They're just, there's a, a, just a Beatles section. Right. Because they're the Beatles. Um, and apparently yeah. they're better than the stones we're being told now. Uh -uh. Yeah, I, my wife just went, whoa, in no. the background. Uh -uh. <laughs> well, yeah, from Sir, I, from Sir a, Paul. <laughs> I love them both. You know, I'm a little bit more of a stones guy, but I, I love the Beatles. So, but um, Beggar's Bank was my like favorite rock record ever. Stones. Yeah. What was that? I like the Beatles. I love the stones. Yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah. I actually love the Beatles too, but Beggar's Banquet is my favorite rock record ever. So I guess that says it right there. So um, uh, in the uh, in this film, in this documentary, again, they you, you see them switching kind of same, a little bit randomly switching what music was being played while while the shoppers were in there. Did you guys ever have any hard fast rules on what could be played when, what time of day, Barry? No, no. When I'm not lazy, I try to um, read. The, I read the customers, and if I'm um, if I'm listening to something, if I'm listening to jazz and the customers come in and they have mohawks a foot high, you know, I think, you know, maybe, maybe I should play something a little more upbeat. And at the other end of the spectrum, if I'm playing stuff that the foot high mohawk person would like, and then, and I'm by myself, and then somebody walks in, it doesn't seem like that. And I also tend to play music louder when I'm by myself. Um, I think music just sounds much better when it's loud. Yeah. And so, um, so I tend to turn it down sometimes when people come in. And I love it when they say, don't turn it down for me. That, yeah. That's always a good start to the interaction. <laughs> uh, so I want to know if either one of you have done this. And they, they mention it in the doc. And of course, it's in high fidelity. Have you ever put a record on uh, while folks are shopping, knowing that once you put it on, you're going to sell several right away, just from people hearing it, sight unseen? Has that ever happened? Or have you ever done that, Barry? Yes, um, I have, and oh, I'm trying to think of uh, oh, oh shoot, it, it escapes me. Yeah, it happened. It happened not long before I, the COVID closures. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't remember the record. Too bad. That would be if I could remember. That would be a, a good one. Hopefully, it'll come to me before the end of this interview. Yeah. Well, let's ask John if he's what his experience in that. Uh, I agree with louder is better. Um, I was Adolf Hitler in my store. None of my employees would dare touch the turntable if I was working. Oh, I love it. That was, that was mine. No, nobody would go close to it when, when I was working. They just, it just wasn't done. I mean, I, uh, Gary used to work for me for 25 years and he wouldn't, he wouldn't touch the turntable unless I wasn't there. And I, I totally, I played what I wanted. I didn't really care what the clientele wanted to hear. I mean, I'd go on binges. I'd play doo-wop for a week and drive all my employees crazy. I'd play gospel for a week and drive all my customers crazy. You know, it just, it was totally what I wanted to hear when I wanted to hear it. And I could go from the Swan Silvertones to George Jones to Hank Ballard and the Midnighters in the course of one day and just drive people nuts. But you know, that was, that was when I listened to music. Yeah. So well, and if I had not... to be there 60 hours a week, I was going to listen to what I wanted to listen to, which wasn't necessarily good business, but it was fun. <laughs> well, if it was about business, like we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Probably it's about making. It's also one of the reasons you own your own store. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
so, and, and I know, uh, John, you and I talked about a little bit about this offline, but, uh, and for you, Barry, too, you both know so much about music and you, you, can, you can talk from a level of almost like a PhD. Do you find guests coming in were intimidated? Uh, especially if you're playing your own music, you're doing what you wanna do, it's your shop, it's your kingdom, and people coming in, do they feel like they were going to school? Kind of, that was a reference in the film. I, I think on some level, level people felt intimidated, but I could also, I had customers that thought I was an expert on classical music or opera, and I know nothing about classical music. I know nothing about opera, but you, you develop a list of, of clientele mentally who do know about different kinds of music, and you can offer a very valid opinion on a lot of different kinds of music that you not only haven't heard, you don't know anything about, and it's a valid opinion because you pick and choose who told you this and who told you that. And it was, um, you know, but, but some customers would get very, you know, they'd be afraid to ask me a question because they didn't want to sound stupid. Right. But it, it's, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather deal with somebody like that because they were, they were fun and they were willing to learn. Yeah, probably the worst person when it comes in and wants to prognosticate and show their knowledge, right? To you, yes. yeah, and tell you your business. Yeah, uh, those those are, those are the window shoppers, though they have no they have no intention of buying anything. Those people. <laughs> That's very true. Oh my! And for me, I don't I don't think people there's not that intimidation factor. One funny thing I frequently have is I forgot what I was going to ask for. That, they I think their brains kind of shut off and and i i'm just patient but no i i, I don't think so uh, they often ask i know this is they may say that i know this is a stupid question and i i will say there there is none here really before i opened my friend thought uh, one guy joked that i was going to make fun of any eagles fans i don't know why he chose the eagles but he did and i said no no peaceful easy feeling is fine and i said and and people like the Eagles, so I said, no problem. I said, I'm not teasing any, ever anybody for what they like, ever. I'm, I'm a firm believer that everybody has a right to their own taste in music, and it used to drive a lot of other record stores owners I know crazy, because to me, Percy Faith is as valid as Little Richard. You know, it's just, it's all, if it makes somebody happy, that's, that's good for them. You know, and I've, I've always believed that. Um, I'm curious if either one, of, well, I think I know the answer for you, John, but uh, for both of you, have you over the years had local bands ask to um, uh, sell their music in your stores on consignment and that those bands eventually become something more? Uh, I've had it with a few bands actually. Um, one of, one of my employees a while back was a guy named Dan Vickery, and I was on vacation in New Orleans. I was like two days into a three-week three, three week vacation, and Dan and Gary were the only two people working in the store, and I got a call from Dan two days into my vacation. I just got hired by Counting Crows. I'm quitting right now. <laughs> Honest. And, and he left, and I was mad for about a minute, and... <laughs> but it was all good. <laughs> and, and you, Barry, have you had had that experience with a? Um, there's there's one there is one band that comes to mind um, that their label they're called the Agro Lights. Um, they're kind of they play 60, 60 style ska, but are newer. And um, it was a very long time ago in the Petaluma days when their label dropped off their first record. And, um, you know, he said, it's really good, listen to it. And I would kind of let the, let the, those freebies pile up and I would, I would, I always, always play them eventually. Yeah. And um, <laughs> the pile was, a lot of it was kind of generic to me. And then that one, I went, wow, this is really good. And now, um, I mean, they're not mainstream, but they're, they're, they're very, very successful. I mean, they make a full-time living from their music. I guess that, to me, that would be a, a that's sign. That's the yeah, That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, at the end of, uh, near the end of the film, when they were doing their top 100 selling records at other music, 
I don't know if you guys can do this off the top of your head. Do you know, for, for both of you over the lifespan of your, your shops, your top two or three selling albums? Go, sure, that's easy. Go ahead, John, you go first. Um, I don't think, I could tell you my top selling single, but albums, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, CDs, probably um, Eva Cassidy was one of my biggest selling ever. Um, vinyl, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, 45, it was a Mill Valley song. Uh, of course. <laughs> far, I made so much more money on that record than Rita Abrams ever did. <laughs> my goodness. Oh, wow. If, if anyone listening to this, just go to YouTube. Find the Mill Valley song. It's very sweet. It's very sweet. Uh -huh. It's of its time for sure. Yeah. <laughs> before, I, before I had my store, I worked um, in a record store in San Jose called Discorama that mainly sold uh, Mexican music and oldies 45s. And there were, there were oldies that were like five or six or 10 years old at the time I was working in the store that we would sell like two or 300 copies a week. It oh was, my God. It was phenomenal how many 45s we sold of just basic, basic oldie 45s. I know uh, there was a record by the Parliaments called I Want to Testify that we, for years, we sold a couple of hundred a week. Wow. Wow. You just, you never know. You never know. Hmm. So, Barry, what was your, what was your top selling? Um, I always go by genre kind of, but Miles Davis kind of blue. Um, Beatles, it, it was always Sgt. Pepper's, but all of a sudden Abbey Road has been kind of e eking that one out more. Um, and usually when somebody passes, it doesn't make a big deal, but uh, Prince Purple Rain though is a, a biggie. Um, Queen actually, after that movie, outsold the Beatles uh, up until recently. Um, they finally slowed down, but Queen, um, from the, t and the greatest thing about that movie was the young kids that came in that I just had a feeling that that movie turned them on to music because their parents would bring them in. They were so excited. And, and, um, my, my wife loves Queen. I've never really thought much of them one way or the other, but I finally saw the movie because it was so popular in the store and I loved it. And um, so Queen's greatest hits and Night of the Opera, they finally slowed down, but they, they outsold the Beatles for the first six months after that movie. I love that. I, I did a, a short lecture once on how different arts cross pollinate like that, you know, and, and, and support each other. Um, and so uh, yeah. Let's quickly also, and Tom, uh, Tom Petty um, was always a big seller, but Greatest Hits and Damn the Torpedoes are, are huge. And for new music, there's a band, um, what, there's not a lot of new music I get really enthusiastic about, but when I do, I really want to push it because Tom Petty, Queen, and Prince, and Beatles, and Miles don't need pushing. Yeah. But, um, but there's a, a current new punk band called Amel and the Sniffers. And they're a female singer. And they're I'm from writing this down. A-M-Y-L. It's a play on words. Her name's Amy Louise. So between the, the drug and her name, it's Amel and the Sniffers. And um, they're punk, but they're very uh, rock and roll, like pub, Aussie pub, pub rock and ACDC. Anyway, um, both of their first two records were huge sellers uh, because I was just, I send, I send weekly emails out, which are a big, a huge part of my business. And when there's a, something new I like a lot, I, I, I really want, I want, I want it for the artist. I want to uh, push them hard. And so um, Amol and the Sniffers. That's great. See, and I love this. And this is like with this film, it just, it would, you know, getting introduced to things you would never have probably introduced in your life. Uh, I had never heard of, of Jackson C. Frank. I know, you know, uh, Simon 
had uh, produced that 65 album, but I had not heard of him before. And, and since watching this film, I've listened to that 65 album a couple times, just beautiful music. I had never heard of the Dis Disintegration Loop, the 9-11 the tribute track, you know? Uh, just amazing that you would only find in a record store like that, right? Or, or around people who are that passionate. So that's yeah, just- The thing I really enjoyed about that documentary was how excited the employees got over something new they found. Yeah. You know, and that, that level of excitement just doesn't, from what I've seen, doesn't happen in the music business that much anymore. Yeah. It does, which kind of makes it special when it does, but. Yeah, it was just, it was nice to see it. Cause that's, you know, when I took over Village Music in the sixties and early seventies, that's what it was like. People just got excited. Hmm. You know, they just really got excited about what was coming out. And there was something every week to get excited about. And that's, that's just not true anymore. Well, there's no more anticipation, is there? It's, it's no. immediate yeah. now. No, right. That is true, but I do have to say, I have great, cu great customers and virtually everyone is excited when they leave with what they bought. Mm -hmm. so, so at least there is, it's not the enthusiasm for the new stuff. Yeah, not, not necessarily new. No, but but they are enthusiastic about whatever about new discoveries. Yes, but for new releases, no, that's that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's dive in that then for uh, to, to finish up here the the future of the record store. I mean, there's and and I'm seeing both things. So there's there's really I, I can't I can't say this generation or that generation thinks lockstep because certainly they don't. But there is a problem I think with the generation coming up about paying for music because they're used to getting so much music for free and i and i know that just from I, I produce a couple summer concert series and dealing with bands have been touring for 20 30 years and it's it's the reverse the the touring used to support the record album right and now it's the touring is how they're making their money because they're not making any that much money on on the records right unless they can sell it at the concert itself um so I'm going to throw out a couple. What I what I'm seeing is is this new gen generation coming up? Are they going to are they embracing vinyl because it's a hipster thing, or because I don't know it, it's the cool thing now, or are they really appreciating the feel, the sound, the texture, the uh, the physicality of it? Um, is there going to be enough of those people coming up to make it work? I guess. Hope so, but I doubt it. <laughs> well, I, well Barry's you know, still doing it so it's when I was growing up if, if you were a kid growing up my age in the in the 50s if you wanted to meet girls and get laid you learned how to play guitar that's right in in like the 90s and early 2000s growing up if you were a kid you wanted to meet girls and get laid you learned how to be a disc jockey yeah and and that sort of brought vinyl back. And now, you know, in the 50s, it was cool to play guitar. Nowadays, it's cool to listen to vinyl. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think you can overestimate the cool factor involved, mm -hmm. uh, which is why the CD market is in the toilet and bordering on non-existent. Mm -hmm. Vinyl has, for some reason that I certainly don't understand, it's become cool. And is that, it sustainable? Um, <laughs> I hope so. You know, I, just for my own peace of mind, I really hope so. But I'm, I'm not sure, given the situation we're in right now, anything is sustainable anymore. Yeah. Well, know, I, just, I just don't know. That's why I worry if it's a hipster thing. I, if, I, I, in the last couple of years, I've gone to some nice hotels. And uh, the latest thing is to have a record player in the corner with a selection of different records there, right? Yeah. Of course, there's all the other conveniences, but they've got this old photograph there, right? So it, it, it almost feels like a, a totem. It's not real. I play the records when I'm there, right? But I, I couldn't believe it the first time I walked into Barnes & Noble a year or two ago, and they had a huge rec vinyl department in Barnes and Noble of all places. And I thought, boy, there's something going on that I just, I missed or I don't understand. 
And, and I mean, Barry, maybe Barry, you can speak to this too, where you both know you're both still in the business and it's kind of, again, dovetails into the cinema. No one's going to make a lot of money at this. We know that it's, and what was interesting in this documentary about how their biggest years was 2000, I think 2000 and well in 2001 with the, with the uh, terrorist attack, but the sales were with the cheaply produced in high mar mar uh, high margins on CDs, right? Yeah. So to make it work with vinyl, you got to sell a lot because your margins aren't so great, as I understand it, right? So it's never, mm -hmm. yeah. Is that Barry? Is that? You know, I I, I don't agree with that. With, okay. It, it, I think it's different. I think I mean the main challenge, of course, right now. I mean, if we had this conversation two, two or three months ago, it would be completely different. So yeah, now right. the challenge will be, you know, reopening and then seeing what happens after that. But I, I think the first few months are going to be rough and then things will get back to normal. Mm -hmm. But um, but my my customers are, I think they, they're just appreciative of it for what it is, for what vinyl is. They always have been. When I first opened in 98, I thought I was going to be a CD store with a little bit of vinyl. And vinyl completely took off, maybe because of my enjoyment of it. I, I've been a, a vinyl store since then. Um, I mean, the store does well and uh, or did well before the pandemic. But uh, yeah. um, and I think people, my customers, like it for what it is. That I don't, I don't think they like it because it's trendy. I, I, I have an amazing customer base. They're wonderful people and. Um, I think they like it for the sound quality and for the vi the visuals of the album artwork and just the enjoyment. And I think a lot of, I think a big reason why it's so popular is in such a digital high tech social media world is that it brings people back to simple analog and a, a simple experience and they get to kind of unwind with it and um, yeah. get away from their wired world while they're listening to that. Hmm. And, um, and, and I don't think it, I don't think it's going away. I, I'm confident that, um, that once the economy uh, rebounds after all this mess, that, um, that it'll be fine. Hmm. So, uh, I, I, I'm, I, in your I'm, camp. Hmm? I'm in your camp. I believe the same thing with cinema. I, I think that, and, and the biggest part of it is, is people want that community again too. They want to walk into your store. They want to be able to talk to you and, you know, ruffle through the record album. It's all, it's a process. It's a whole part of it, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, um, uh, let's see. I have one question here. Um, uh, anonymous. Uh, have you felt the impact of vinyl being carried now at big box stores like Target and Barnes and Nobles uh, with the new hip hop interest in vinyl? I don't, I cannot tell. Um, and then comparing my store to the, the New York store in the movie, um, my best years have been my, my later years. I, for some reason, 2016, I'm not, I would love to know what happened then. I, I have notes every year, but that was kind of, that year was stratospheric, but still the ones after that were, have, weren't 2016 but they're they're still my best years next to that one mm -hmm. and um and it, it is always growing for me and um um so so and i i, I think it's also when you mentioned the the free music thing it's apples and oranges i remember in the late 90s early 2000s a man and he was a window shopper he wasn't buying anything he just said so you must really be hurting because of the mp3s and i said i couldn't care less about them i said i think it's apples and oranges i don't think they do anything they harm me and and i think may, the big box stores may hurt me a, a little bit but i can't even imagine it would be more than one percent mm -hmm. of my business i think um i think the type of person who shops there would likely not be in my store mm -hmm. or they're like a mall shopper and yeah. probably may not even know I exist. I 100% agree with you. I, I The way people consume is the way they consume, right? The way they enjoy their art. In cinema, it's the same thing. I love going to the Rafael, 
going to my theater and watching a movie on a 30 foot screen, but I'm also known to watch a movie on my cell phone. You can consume both ways, right? You can, you can enjoy the MP3 and, and, and have your record collection, right? Yeah. Yes. I so, agree with Barry. Yeah. I think it's, it's a totally different clientele. I mean, I, I was never impacted that much when Tower opened in Marin County. I was never impacted that much with Rainbow Records in the warehouse in Marin County. It's just, it's, I, I would not have been impacted if there'd been a Walmart in the area. You know, it's just, it's a different clientele. Right. You may not, you may not sell a lot of Madonna. You may not sell a lot of Britney Spears. You may not sell a lot of Garth Brooks, but there's other stuff out there. And that's the kind of thing people are going to go to your store to find, you know, the, the people that just buy the top 10 hits aren't going to be Barry's customers and aren't going to be my customers. To be honest, this, I don't even know what some of the top 10 hits are. <laughs> so uh, there was a time, there was a time in the late nineties, early two thousands, I, I could look at a Billboard 100 chart, top 100 albums, and there were maybe, maybe 10 albums on the entire chart that I had ever sold a copy of, that anyone had ever asked me for. Right. It, it's just a different, it, it's a different set of people. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, and again, go back, because I always like going back to cinema. You don't, you don't see us playing Avengers at the Rafael, right? It's, it's going to be things you can't find anywhere else, right? Yeah. Um, this goes to a great question we have from Kenneth. He says, as record store owner, how do you find out about new music and new bands? It's harder now than it used to be, um, really. To be honest, um, I, I, I listen very closely to what every single customer asks for and talks about. Um, but it's not, I mean, the record companies don't send promos like they used to. They don't. The, the labels, the distributors, they don't share like they used to. Um, so, so it's not easy. It's just, uh, it's just listening closely and um, paying a lot of attention. I guess I pay attention to what other people on social media say also, you know, my, my followers, what they're listening to. My last 10 or 15 years in business, and it was probably a shortcoming on my part, but I, the only new music I listened to was were things that customers I respected recommended to me. Mm -hmm. I didn't go out looking for it. I didn't search it out because there was just there was too much old music I really wanted to hear that I knew I loved. And I just the only the only new things I ever listened to were if somebody I respected said, you know, you really ought to listen to this, then I would. Yeah. But I didn't I didn't go out searching it and considering the business I was in, I probably should have. <laughs> so, uh, John, there's not a question here. It's a shout out to you from uh, Sandra Eastburn, daughter of Joe Eastburn, who had Eastburn Tool and Rental in Mill Valley saying hello. Hi, Sandra. <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, let's see here. Not a question, just a shout out to Barry. Best regular email with excellent recommendations every week. Who is that? Uh, Dave said that. Okay. All right. I don't know which day, but thank you, Dave. All right. So, hey, here's a here's our uh, results of our poll. Uh, 82% vinyl, 7% cassette tape, 7% CD, zero MP3s, and 4% oh, yeah. 4% other. So whatever the other is. Well, maybe it's older people bought 78s. Yeah. Or yeah. Okay. Could be. <laughs> uh, I mean, I bought eight tracks early when I was a teenager. I don't know. Yeah. Although I bought 45s before eight tracks, but still. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw a CD uh, in a CD player and I thought it was just magic. It blew my mind. <laughs> At the time, it was, it was brand new magic. I had kids in my store that felt the same way about a vinyl record. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They just, what does this do? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so guys, this has been a blast. I've enjoyed it so much. So, um, so John, tell us uh, how people can uh, get a hold of you and, and get an appointment to look at your, uh, in your warehouse. Uh, pretty much right now, uh, just email me and give me a day or two's notice and I, I can meet them down there. Um, cool. Now, what email would you like out there? Uh, it's villagemuse at aol.com. That's V-I-L-L-A-G-E-M-U-S 
at AOL.com. I'd say you could call me at the store, but the phone company screwed up my phone and I don't get messages anymore. Eek. And Barry, uh, you got been eager enough to deal with the phone company lately. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how many folks visit you when, when we're not in a lockdown? How much action were you getting in your, your warehouse by appointment? Uh, you know, two or three a week. And I'm open. Uh, when I was open, I was open five hours a week on Saturdays, which is, for me, it was plenty. It got me out of the house and the people that really wanted to see me could find me. And, yeah, and I see people I would never see otherwise. Yeah. And it's not like I'm ever going to run out of stuff. The ones that know, know, and they seek you out. Yeah. And the other ones I don't, at this point in my life, don't really care that much. You know, <laughs> it's just fun to have people wander by. Yeah. And Barry, I, uh, I know we're, you, you and I are kind of in the same boat sitting here on Force Street. We're waiting for, uh, for what it's going to look like in the next couple months to open up. But are you doing anything online or uh, can people do? Uh, uh, yeah, I've been, uh, a lot of, uh, I, I'm pretty fortunate. I'm, business is, although a fraction of, av of normal, it's far, far more than I thought it would be um, between curbside pickup and mail orders. A lot of people are comfortable coming to the door and me sticking my arm way out with, with my mask on and then stick in there so a lot of people are i'd say half the people are okay with that and half the people they they want me to ship it um yeah. a few blocks away um but I, i'm sending a lot of stuff to the east bay in san francisco because mm -hmm. i have a lot of customers there so I'm, I'm doing a lot of both my my weekly email updates are um they've always been a big part of my business but now they're virtually now they're everything yeah and yeah. um so I'm still sending those out once a week and, and th those are kind of a, th those are how I'm making my living now. Right. And what, uh, what's, is it the website people should go to? Well, no, uh, what you want to, the website d does not have a, an updated inventory on it because my inventory is so fluid and the good use stuff sells so fast. Mm -hmm. So if you send me an, an, an email at info at reddevilrecords.net, you just spell it out without any hyphens or underscores. It's info at R E D D E V I L R E C O R D S dot net. So you send me an, in, an email, ask to be put on the email list, and then you'll get our weekly updates. And they're pretty, you have to have, you have, to have patience. They're, they're fairly comprehensive. Um, they are kind of broken down into categories, but um, like rare records, used records, new arrivals, uh, still hot from last week and back in print, back in stock, but they're, um, and my customers are loyal because as I said, although business is way down, it is way better than I could have imagined it would be because people keep ordering off those emails every week. And I am doing, I am uh, off Instagram. I sell, um, I mean, follow, you can follow the store on Instagram. I mean, I generally put pretty fancy rare stuff on instagram that um that doesn't sell in the store that maybe has been in the store for a while I, I make a point of not posting stuff on instagram that's brand new that i think like i just got in a few things that i think will sell on the email right away on monday so i'm not going to post them on instagram because i think they would sell sell to somebody out of the area right away mm -hmm. so instagram i tend to put rare stuff that has has been in the store for a while yeah and i also put post what i barbecued that day and where i hiked that day <laughs> brilliant <laughs> and we're being having to be very creative to survive this uh uh you know, starting i think tuesday we'll be promoting at the rafael uh our rafael to go we're gonna have, we're gonna have concession packages so people should get an album from you come by the rafael get their concessions to go go home listen to some music eat some uh -huh. popcorn See, there we go. Oh, thanks. You guys have always been good at the store. Thank you. Yeah, and we've, we've loved working with you. So much love working with you, John. Uh, hope to have you, John, back uh, for Mill Valley Film Festival again for, for Heidi Ho. I thank you both so much. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Uh, I do want to say that I use the store as a landmark when people ask, uh, your, I mean, your theater, when they ask where we're located, I always say a, a block and a half east of the movie theater. Uh, excellent. <laughs> thank you both so much. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.